I saw you, you know, about one o'clock. You were there. Yeah, I was in the bedroom arguing. When I said you did. Okay, I'll 
to be better than me. Each and every one of you. It's always have to be other circumstances. How are you doing? Uh, cool. Uh, we were going to call the Frank for freshman year at that
psalmist says to us in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. On today we gather to, to celebrate and remember the life of our dear friend, our dear father, brother, husband, son, Colonel Frank Freeman III. And as we embark on this service this evening, uh, it is a time of mourning, but also a time of celebrating uh, the wonderful life of a wonderful man who touched uh, so many people on today. And as we prepare uh, to go through the program as printed, uh, might we bow for a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here on today. God, it's a sad occasion in many ways, but we want to start off just by saying thank you. Thank you for allowing us to have met and have known, have lived, have worked, to have been befriended by Frank Freeman. We ask you, God, as we gather here, that you would join us here in this place. God, that you would comfort like only you can comfort. Cheer like only you can cheer. God, touch, heal, deliver like only you can. God, let everything that we do in this service be for your glory. Let everything we do in this service give your name honor. And God, we pray that you wrap your loving arms around this family, uh, Sister Elsa, Sister Kaylin, Sister Shirley, uh, all the family and all the friends who have gathered today. Hug us, God, like only you can. And at the end of the day, we'll be ever so careful to give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. For it's in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, the one who was and is and is to come, that we pray on today. And together, the people of God say, Amen. 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 Can we put our hands together and give God a hand? <laughs> God is always worthy. God is always worthy to be praised. And we honor him on this day. Uh, you have the printed program before you uh, and subject to any renovations, any alterations by the Spirit of God, we will follow it as printed. And at this time, uh, we will have readings from the Old Testament coming from Sister Renee uh, Fuller and, is it Fuller? I'm sorry, Sister Renee Fuller. And then uh, a reading from the New Testament we will have from Brother Lewis Williams. So please come in that order. A reading from the Old Testament, Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul.
The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Let the Lord add a blessing to this reading. verses 1 through 3. It reads as thus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. May God have a reading and a blessing of his word. Amen. Okay, at this time we will have a selection uh, from Yolanda Wilson. Not a second of another minute, not an hour of another day, but Lord, at this moment, with my arms outstretched, I need you to make a way, as you have done so many times before, through a window or an open door. I stretch my hands to thee, come rescue me, I need you right away, I need you now. Another day, but Lord, I 
favors for me and he's now I gotta pay him back. <laughs> so I'm here. But uh, next uh, we, we're at the section where we're gonna have brief reflections from friends and families. Um, now I, I'm I'm not gonna I'm saying they say it's brief. Y'all know what brief means, right? <laughs> <laughs> don't come up here and preach a sermon, all right? If you got one, hold on to it, but don't bring it up here, all right? So we're gonna we wanna uh, at this time uh, have brief reflections from friends and family. I'm assuming they, they're coming here to the pulpit. Right? So you just make your way to the uh, pulpit right here. Howard University playing basketball. Uh, that's what that's how we initially met, but that's not what brought us together. What brought us together was family, a uh, bunch of New Yorkers and a whole bunch of other people. A lot of laughs, a lot of good times, looking at his first roommate right there. <laughs> um, you know, absent, absent from the body, present with the Lord. This is a tough one, but uh, He's in a better place and he's feeling no pain. Uh, first cousin Ed Dow, we were, me, Dave Williams, uh, Lou, a couple other people, uh, groomsmen in his wedding. Watched him start a beautiful family and watched him grow. Last time I saw that little girl, she was about here, a grown woman now. But uh, just know that whenever we spoke, it would surprise some of you. Uh, it surprised his mother-in-law when I said Frank spoke to you often, and, and, and he always spoke well. Right? <laughs> That's not always the case with in-laws, but I'll be brief. But I know that he loved everyone in here, and I know we all love him back, and he's in a better place. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Frank was my uh, boss, and uh, he was definitely a light 
in my life. I didn't know him as long as many of you did, but those lights in your life, you remember them for the duration of yours. Uh, he had this larger than life personality. And um, people, people spoke about him that way. <clears throat> he was the type of person where leadership came naturally to him. And he knew that leadership was not a noun, it was a verb. He walked around and he talked to people. And it wasn't forced. Made me nervous sometimes when he would talk to some of the people that, uh, you know, worked for me. I was always wondering what he was asking. <laughs> what scoop they were giving him. And sometimes I would get brave enough to ask him. And he would sometimes say, uh, we talked about football, we talked about video games. <laughs> um, but that's just the type of person he was. He would have a genuine conversation with anybody that he just passed by. Didn't make a difference who they were, where they were on the chain of command. He saw a person and he talked to them like a person, like a human being. Yes. That light in my life. I heard somewhere where um, you're not supposed to judge someone with their obituary by the born day or their coming home day. You're supposed to judge them with the dash because it doesn't make a difference how long you live. That's not a good life, it's how well you live. Frank lived well. I'm sure his obituary could have been 10 pages. Yeah. <laughs> I had an op opportunities to talk to him about where he had been, and the accomplishments that he had made. and I could feel that mentorship in him starting to guide my life, my professional career, that life. And um, he did it with a smile. He did it with him just being genuine. And I'll miss him. Thank you. God bless you. for coming. I'm Kaylin. Um, Y'all probably know that though. <laughs> um, sorry, I have my notes on my phone. I didn't want to lose track. Um, so anyone that knows my dad knows that um, he was a very good talker, speaker. Um, so this is not going to be that, but um, you know, he was a very funny guy and he was, always had a way of getting everyone in the room to laugh, telling a story, making you feel like you were in that story. I will try, but we'll see. Those are big shoes to fill. Um, just hearing people telling stories about my dad recently, um, it's, it's always the same three things that you hear them say. Oh. My dad was a very good person. And um, thank you. And um, he was very smart. And um, and um, he always um had a way of giving you the best advice and guiding you. And I just thank him because I am the person that I am today because of him. Um, 
he, uh, in a way, without knowing it, I think he trained me for this day. Um, and I always knew that he was very proud of me, but to hear everyone um, telling me, you know, how much he talked about me and the things he would say about me, it just confirmed that for me. Um, he was always willing to help others as well. Um, if he considered you a friend or a family member or anyone, if you needed him, he was always there. Um, and by the things that I've been hearing other people say about him, I know um, that he also did that for others as well, you know, training them and guiding them to be better people. And I just um, want, I just want to continue to be like him. Um, so. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Felicia Tyler. Um, I met Mr. Freeman, which I affectionately nicknamed him Uncle Frank. Um, during his time, I was his tech at the hospital. So throughout the whole time from the admission up until his um, departure, um, we, be, we bonded. Um, I would be excited when he was on my assignment. He would be happy that he was on my assignment. Um, family, you know, we were all like, I felt like, I felt like I was part of him, part of them. Uh, we had a lot of conversations. Um, he had, like you said, the best advice, relationship-wise. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, you know, he had to make me look at myself, maybe it's you. So, <laughs> um, you know, he taught, he left his daughter, um, she left him, you know, um, his wife, um, Miss Elsa, he just left his whole family. Um, we talked, I learned about his, his life, his history, um, I learned about uh, when he got married, and I learned everything about Mr. Freeman, well, Uncle Frank, and he was really a genuine, patient person. He, um... Some things, you know, when it came down to his care, he would tell you how you take care of him. And I learned a lot, you know, from that because he went through something. But, you know, even though he went through something, the fight is over. You know, he fought. And when I say he fought, he fought. And when it was time for him to go, it was a big celebration. We were so excited for him. You know, but God had other plans for him. You know, and that's the way we got to look at it. You know, God had other plans. You know, he was, yeah, I'm, you know, we, we talked about him getting back everything. You know, how he, the first thing he was going to do was hit the tub when he got home. You know, so, you know, I, I really adored him. I really did adore him um, and the family as well. And family, you know, we can may adore for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. But the, look to the author and the finisher of your faith. You know, look to the hills for the help. And as long as you do that, yeah, we, we, you know, we can say that all day long until you've been there, you know. But when you get there, trust God. Yeah. Trust God in the process, you know. So, um, I didn't come here to come preach. I just left church. I just did But I just want you all to know how much I adore Mr. Frank, uh, well, Uncle Frank, you know. So. Good afternoon. 
everybody. Uh, my name is David Dixon. I'm uh, like uh, many of us brothers here and sisters. We're from Howard University. Uh, new, I've known Frank probably about the same time as, as Miles, maybe 1983. I came in in 81, uh, Miles as well. Uh, met Frank, I believe. Frank, I'm pretty sure Frank was an engineering student at Howard, just like I was, um, a couple of years behind. So we spent many a long night in that green room at, at Howard University School of Engineering. Um, over the years, we, you know, were able to share good family moments. I know I attended the wedding, Elsa. Um, we definitely, um, when he was promoted at Bowling Air Force Base to Colonel, we were a lot of us were there. So, um, you know, I just wanted to let you know, Elsa, Kaylin, the family, uh, the Howard University brothers got you right. If you need anything from any of us, you know, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we love Frank. Uh, we want to honor him that way. And, you know, it's tough. I mean, we can't lean to our own understanding. Yeah. So, thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Gwen, Frankie's aunt. And um, I just want to say we had Frankie for 57 wonderful years. And looking at the pictures, looking back at those memories were great. We're going to miss him. Uh, I want to thank his mother, Shirley, for giving us such a wonderful nephew and for his wife for taking such good care of him <laughs> and his daughter for those beautiful words. But um, he's going to be with his father and his sister and brother. I'm sure they'll they have missed him, and they'll be glad for him to come home to them. Good afternoon, family. I, um, I, uh, I need my print a little bigger because I'm not as young as Kayla. <laughs> um, my name is Lewis Williams. I'm also a Howard University grad, and uh, I met Frank um, back the same time as the other brothers who came in, uh, ahead of us. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief, but if you know me, the laughter that you heard was those people who know me for uh, as like. Uh, Free, as we call them, for 38 years. They know grief is not in my vocabulary. But um, I met Frank, uh, as I met a couple of these gentlemen back in 1982. And uh, it was interesting that uh, I met Frank before I, I met him. People told me about Frank, and I'm sure people told Frank about me, and they kept saying, um, hey, Lou, you got a, this guy, a cousin that goes to Howard? He reminds me of you. And um, I was like, no, I don't know. And then I met Frank, and I, I don't know why people thought we were related, but um, it's God divine because even from then, I didn't know we were going to be these kind of friends that we are. So um, we, uh, we became friends. I met Frank, and uh, like I met a lot of guys, uh, I liked him. There's nothing about him I didn't like, but uh, he was an okay guy. And then the following year, uh, Frank moved into my dorm, and I was his RA. And uh, uh, for all those people who are here and they remember me being their RA, you just raise your hand. <laughs> um, so Frank and uh, his guys moved into there, and, uh, and that's where our relationship grew. And uh, it, it was uh, it was one uh, of many uh, ups and downs and laughter. And, uh, and when I look back, that was one of my best years at Howard University uh, at 1983-84 because of the, the friendships that, that was born. Uh, like the gentleman before me, uh, Dave and Miles was a year ahead of me. I was behind them, and then Frank and Doug and Mike Stu and Chisholm, they were behind me. And so to this day, we are all friends. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the women who were there who you know, helped us along the way and made us a sandwich or two. <laughs> <laughs> even after college, Frank and our relationship seemed to even grow even deeper. Uh, Frank uh, got commissioned into the military and then uh, went off to his first duty station in Fort Walton Beach. And, uh, and I went to visit him, and the first thing he remembered saying was like, nobody's coming to Fort Walton to visit, there's not much to do. And I said, well, because you're there, and I'm going to come and visit, and the 
two of us together make fun, just like I visit uh, many of my friends, uh, even in Knoxville, Tennessee. It was not fun, but there was one of my friends there. <laughs> I went to visit them the same way. Uh, even after Frank moved on from Fort Walton, um, we kept in touch. Um, uh, I mentioned most people under 40, we wrote letters. I wrote Frank everywhere he was stationed, and he wrote back. And as people said, uh, Frank had an unbelievable wit. Frank could write a letter that would make you laugh as if he was standing there talking to you. His humor was, was unbelievable because it came from his intelligence, his wit. And so we would write each other. And the last letter I got from Frank, and Frank is not sentimental like me, and he doesn't like a big fanfare, but I kept every letter. And I have the last letter that Frank wrote me from Okinawa, Japan. And it said something like, hey, Louie, he would call me that. Uh, I'm coming back to DC. Find us a, a two-bedroom apartment so we can live together, save some money, and buy our first home. And that was the plan. And to Frank's plan, it came true. Uh, I got an apartment. And anybody who knows Frank know that Frank wasn't the neatest person. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I got that letter to, um, to be Frank's roommate, um, this person doesn't know it, but I had, to, um, I had to reach deep in myself and find my inner Chisholm and Mike Stu, who was Frank's roommates in college. And I saw how they were Frank's roommate. They did it with excellence, uh, with pride. They, um, uh, they knew their friend. They knew him well. And so Frank and I roomed together, and just like he had planned, we saved up a lot of money, and we both bought our first homes. And that was his plan. But God had a different plan. Because while Frank and I were saving up money and living together, he let out two angels uh, on earth that became our wives. Frank was dating his wife, Elsa, and I was dating my wife, Melissa. And the two of us, the two of them, put up with us. <laughs> and how they did that uh, was awesome. But we wind up marrying these two, and Frank married Elsa, and shortly after, about a year and a half later, I married my wife. And, uh, and they have been together ever since, and, and we have been together. And so I thank God for their reunion uh, as well as ours. But that's not it. Frank and I, um, in our separate ways, he was, again, pre stationed all over the U.S. And one Sunday, out of the blue, I was at a timeshare presentation called Massanon. And I was just asked to go down there. My wife and I went on a Sunday, and as God had it, Guess who also was there? Frank and Elsa. And they were sitting right next to us. And we ran into each other. Long story short, we brought a timeshare together. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it created a relationship between our families because from that timeshare, we vacationed with the Freemans every year since 2006 until the girls were like 15 years old. And so every summer, Kaylin and my daughter Bree and my son and my wife and the Freemans, we vacationed all over the U.S., up and down the U.S. And those are some great memories that I know we won't forget. Hilton Head, uh, Massanut, uh, Disney World when they went, uh, Massanut and uh, Poconos, uh, Bush Gardens, uh, Hershey State Park, and even one vacation where Mother Freeman was with us on that vacation. And so we, uh, we remember those times. And so we were been joined at the hip for a long time. And, um, I think about those memories, and I um, and I know going forward we won't create any new memories. But as you said, Helen, uh, there's a lot of people in this room that can share stories about your dad uh, that you haven't heard, like those nights and walking the halls in the engineering building. Uh, pretty, a lot of his colleagues can attest to that. And um, and then you can talk to Bree. She followed in your dad. Mike Stu, Dave, and those engineering guys, she followed in your footsteps and walked through those halls and, and studied late at night and two and three o'clock in the morning. And so she can share with you what it's like to have graduated from Howard University as an engineer, because we're proud of him, as I'm proud of all of my friends who came through that program. So the last thing I want to say to you guys is there's been this talk about this real HU, and uh, I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> Those of us from Howard don't have this discussion, but I'm going to set it. Uh, I'm going to end it right here because uh, Frank is now enrolled in the real HU. And Chisholm remembers this. Frank is now enrolled and he's checked in. He left us on Monday, September 19th, and he checked into Heaven University. Yes, sir.
And so I'm sure he's checking in and uh, getting settled. And as one of the family members said, he's checked in. And you remember what I read earlier, John 14, where it says, not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Because in my father's house, Jesus said there are many mansions. He didn't say many rooms. He said many mansions. That should preach right there, y'all. <laughs> Because I believe, and I'm going to use my sanctified imagination, I believe that he has many mansions, one for each family surname. And so when you get to heaven, your family surname has a mansion. And so Frank checked in, and he checked in where? That Freeman mansion. He see his brother, he see his sister, his father, and he's fine. Because his RA, it's not me. <laughs> his RA is going to be Jesus Christ. He's going to be He's going to walk in there and he's going to check on Frank the same way I did you guys when you came into the dorm. I was there to greet you, make sure everything was going to be okay. They felt comfortable. Jesus is now checking in on Frank. And if you know Frank Freeman, he is logical. He is smart. He's intelligent. You can't tell him something unless you prove it. So when Jesus shows up, that look on Frank's face is going to be amazement because of the glory of the Lord our Savior. But you know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to look at Frank and he's going to go, Still don't believe. <laughs> and he gonna say, put your finger in my hand where they nailed me to the cross, right? It's okay. Because that's like he said to his disciple Thomas. He said, put your finger in my hand. He's gonna say, Frank, it's okay. Put your hand on my side where they pierced me. Because Frank's gonna need that belief. And, and the Lord is gonna say, it's okay, Frank. Thomas was doubting until he actually saw him. And so he's gonna do the same. And Frank is gonna be amazed and bewildered. And he's gonna check in with his family. And then later on, they're going to have praise and worship. And he's going to go on down there. My family member, my sister Val, is going to go down and walk in there and say, tell me about my brother when you're at house. What kind of crazy things I know he did. And so he's going to check in and see all of those people. And so, I, you know, as I know, Frank doesn't like a lot of big fanfare. One of the things I shared with the family is um, um, one of the hardest things uh, to deal with when someone that you lost is to recover the you that went away when they left. So when Frank left us, uh, a lot of us went with him. His wife and his daughter, his mother, his family, his friends, we're gonna miss that you and us. And so we have to help each other to recover that you. So I know Frank doesn't like a lot of fanfare. I remember when he was pinning ceremony for Fulberg Kerner, he didn't even wanna tell anybody. I had to beg him to tell us so that we could show up and be there to support him. But for him, it was just a 30-minute ceremony, and it was nothing, but it meant a lot to us uh, because he re reached Fulbert Colonel before he turned 50, and that was a, uh, a feat in itself. So, Frank, I'm not going to say any more. Um, I'm just going to give you that, um, that homeboy nod and go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Frank and I we got back in contact in 2020 during COVID. He was 
looking for information that we shared. As we were supporting our staff folks to keep them safe. So we, we, we can our relationship, sharing information, talking on the phone, and this way, what was as it was before. <laughs> And you all. I can't. I can't add anything more to, to who Frank is. You guys know who Frank is. Who he is and what he's accomplished. My condolences to the family. He'd be missed terribly. someone in reference to Frank, I learned a little bit more about him. It's almost as if, uh, I'm not as old as you guys, so I, I wasn't at how old. <laughs> but, uh, but he sounded like the kind of, kind of gentleman that I would have uh, liked to have been around, like to spend time with. Um, I just pray that when I'm called home, that I had that many folks that would show up and speak some uh, well, if they just speak a few decent things about me, that'd be pretty good. I'll be happy with that. But look, we got we're gonna move on with the program. We have another selection uh, by Reverend Dr. Janine Jackson. To be honest, I'm a little torn on which song to sing, but we're gonna go ahead and keep this appropriate for the hymn appropriation of it. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest in the meadow's grass, and he leads me beside the quiet stream. to do what honors him the most. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. <coughs> safe in his
how the Holy Spirit works safe in his arms. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Frank Freeman, uh, but I've learned so much about him in the past uh, few days, had the opportunity to sit with Elsa and with Kaylin the other night uh, to hear stories about Frank, had a chance to sit with Lou, uh, and Lou gave some brief remarks as we talked the other night. That was a joke. Lou uh, <laughs> uh, gave some wonderful remarks about uh, Frank, or who uh, Lou called free. Tonight, I, today, I want us to just take a look at a very familiar passage of scripture. Psalm 23. Mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 23. I want to read one verse in your hearing. Verse 4. It reads like this in the New King James Version. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And for the next few minutes, I want to talk about making it through the valley. Making it through the valley. There are a few things in life that make most of us uncomfortable as much as death does. Perhaps it is the reminder of our own mortality and that each of us is just a pilgrim passing through this earthly experience. Perhaps it is that death takes from us the company and the familiar presence of those we love and cherish. Perhaps it is the seeming inequity or randomness of those who are selected to pass through death's cold portal. In other words, sometimes it's hard to understand why my loved one died and not someone down the street. There are a few things that in life make us as uncomfortable as death does. Anybody praying with me today? I suspect that for many of us what makes death uncomfortable, unnerving, unpleasant, unsettling, unappealing, unpalatable is that death is unpredictable and uncertain. You and your loved one can be here today and gone tomorrow. And as a matter of fact, you or your loved one could be here today and gone today. That's why the songwriter wrote, time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Perhaps it is the uncertainty of of death that led one famous author to write, it's not that I'm afraid to die, it's, it's just that I don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> and that there are a few things in life that make us as uncomfortable as, as death does. Death is unpredictable, but guess what? So is life. Not only does life have twists and turns, but life has ups and downs, highs, and lows, mountains and valleys. Somebody know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, there yeah. are highs, getting married, yeah, yeah. Uh, the birth of a baby, graduating from school, buying a new home, getting a new job, or getting a promotion. And, yeah. and then there are, are lows, uh, breaking up, experiencing divorce. Your baby is still a baby, having a baby getting laid off, getting bad news from the doctor, or dealing with the death of a loved one. Highs and lows, ups and downs, mountains and valleys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And although we come today to celebrate the life of Frankie, uh, Frank Snap, <laughs> Free, <laughs> Colonel Freeman, if we're honest about it, losing a loved one is never easy. This is not one of those highs uh, that we experience in life. Rather, this is one of those 
valley experiences, one of those low times that test and disturb and trouble us. This, this is one of those downs, one of those lows that disappoint us, disturb us, vex us, and exasperate us. And it is in one of those times where we find David in Psalm 23, verse 4. The psalmist doesn't say explicitly uh, the situation that prompted him to write this psalm, but what is clear is that David somehow found himself in an extraordinarily uncomfortable situation that he, that he describes not only as the valley, but as the valley of the shadow of death. I hear y'all talking to me. And as we remember, Brother Frank, a loved and cherished husband, father, son, and friend, and as we continue through the stages of grief resulting from losing him, I, I believe this familiar verse of scripture provides both comfort and guidance about how we can make it through the valley of these low and disappointing times. And if you'll permit me to share a few things about making it through the valley, I'll get out of your way. First of all, if you're going to make it through the valley, the text suggests it's a matter of perseverance. Somebody say that, perseverance. At the beginning of verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That, that, that's a matter of perseverance. It is significant that the psalmist says that he's walking through the valley. David is not running or skipping or marching. The text is clear that David walked. And what that suggests to me is that when we experience lows, downs, valleys in our lives, the only way to make it is to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. 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 Uh, when you find yourself in one of the difficult positions like we are in today, when we are in one of those twists or turns, some, and when we're in the situation where we lost a brother, a husband, a father, a son, a friend, the only way to make it is just to keep on walking. It's a matter of perseverance. You can't rush through the experience. Otherwise, the text would have said, yea, though I run through the valley. You, you can't overpower this experience. Otherwise, the text would have said, yea, though I march through the valley. You can't ignore the experience. Otherwise, the text would have said, yea, though I skip through the valley. The text doesn't say any of that. Rather, the text says, yea, though I walk through the valley. It is a matter of perseverance. Here's what I like about the first part of the text. The text says, yea, though I walk through the valley. Oh, that blesses me right there. The, the, the preposition used to describe David's interaction with the valley is that David is walking through the valley. David doesn't say, I'm going to walk in the valley. David doesn't say, I'm going to walk around the valley. David doesn't say that he came to stay, that he was sticking around. He wasn't building a house there. He wasn't putting up a tent there. Yeah, rather, the text says David was walking through the valley. Oh, the preposition blesses me. The, the preposition through means to come in and then to come out. The promise of the text is I may be in the valley right now, but sooner or later, I'm coming out of the valley. It's just a matter of perseverance. It, it, it doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable. It hurts. I know it's painful. I know you don't like it. I know you wish things might be different, but keep on walking through it. You may be in the middle of the valley, in the middle of sadness, in the middle of disappointment, in the middle of a frightening situation, in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. The grieving process is real, but you've got to go through it. It's a matter of perseverance. But not only that, if you're going to make it through the valley, it's also a matter of perception. Somebody say that, perception. perception. The text says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow mm -hmm. of death. Mm -hmm. Well, that's significant. David doesn't say that he was in the valley of death. He says he was in the valley of the 
shadow mm -hmm. of death. Mm -hmm. He had the right mm -hmm. perception mm -hmm. about the situation. If, if you're going to make it through the valley, you've got to understand what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You see, shadows are funny mm -hmm. things. There are two important things to remember about shadows. First of all, you can't have a shadow unless you have some light. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me say that again. You cannot have a shadow unless you have some light. Shadows are created when some object comes between you or some focal point and a source of light. If you see a shadow, there's got to be a light somewhere. Just, just keep on walking through the situation and, 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 and in time, you'll find the light. Keep putting one foot in front of the other until you see the light. I know it's scary. I know it's dark. I know it uh, might feel lonely. You might be discouraged. You might be intimidated. But remember this. If there's a shadow, there's a light somewhere. It's a matter of perception. Second of all, shadows have a way of distorting reality. Depending on the position of the light source and uh, the, the, the thing that is blocking the light source, a shadow can appear much larger than the object that's casting the shadow. Uh, sometimes that, that shadow of trouble is scarier than the trouble itself. Sometimes uh, uh, the shadow that you might be facing is more intimidating than the thing itself. It's a matter of perception. Don't let the shadow fool you. Uh, despite being in the valley, David's eyes were open and he perceived his surroundings the right way. What are you talking about, preacher? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. When What David understood is that the shadow of a dog can't bite you. And the shadow of a snake can't poison you. The shadow of a bus can't run over you. And the shadow of death can't kill you. It's a matter of perception. It's a matter of perseverance. It's a matter of perception. But not only that, if you're going to make it through the valley, it's also a matter of presence. Mm. Somebody say that, presence. presence. The text says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. It, it, it's a matter of presence. I don't know about you, but that encourages my heart. Uh, notice what the writer does here in Psalm 23. Uh, throughout Psalm 23, David refers to the divine in the third person. That is, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name is saved. But then you come to verse 4. And David switches from the third person talking about someone else to the second person where he's talking to someone else. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you or thou are with me. In other words, David says, I can make it through the valley because, Lord, I know you are with me. David stopped talking, stopped talking about God and starts talking to God. <laughs> David stops talking about the divine and starts talking to the divine. And even in the midst of our trouble, even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of our tribulation, in the midst of sickness and divorce and uh, dealing with the fools on your job or the fool in your house or maybe even the fool in your bed, you would deal, do well to learn how to talk to the divine. I can make it through the valley because I can talk to God and God is with me. That's why the songwriter said, now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. And when you feel a little prayer will turn and you will know a little fire is burning, find a little talk with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Makes it right. Yeah. Not only can I talk to God, I can have confidence mm -hmm. that the Lord is with me. Yeah. 
And I don't know about you, but I can face anything as long as I know the Lord is with me. Somebody talk to me today. I, I don't care what or who I have to face. I know I'm going to be all right as long as the Lord is with me. Sickness, I'm going to be all right. The Lord is with me. Disease. I'm going to be all right. Why? The Lord is with me. Depression. I'm going to be all right. Why? The Lord is with me. Racism. I'm going to be all right. Why? The Lord is with me. Scandalize my name. I'm going to be all right. Why? Because the Lord is with me. We can make it through the valley as long as we know the Lord. The Lord is with us. I'm not just talking about anybody walking with you. I'm talking about the Lord. I'm talking about Yahweh, the self-existent one, the eternal, the divine, the one who was before there was and is. I'm talking about the Lord, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the chairman of the cosmos, the ultimate judge, the real H-N-I-C, the sovereign, the wise, the infinite, the immutable, the self-existent, self-sufficient, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, faithful, good, gracious, loving, merciful, righteous, holy, transcendent, and imminent living God. I can face anything as long as I know that, that Lord is with me. It's a matter of presence. I, I like the way the psalmist put it in Psalm 34. The Lord is near to those. Mm. who are of a broken heart and saves those mm. who are of a contrite spirit. We can face anything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, even this heartbreaking, consequential, significant loss, as long as we know that the Lord yeah. is with us. It's a matter of perseverance. Yeah. It's a matter of perception. Yeah. It's a matter of presence, but not only of that, it's a matter of protection. Amen. Somebody say that, protection. protection. Yea, though I walk yeah. through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. What else? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Oh, that's good news. Even in the midst of the valley, not only is the Lord with us, but the Lord protects us. I don't know about you, but that, that blesses me. I'm so glad that the Lord shows up and the Lord doesn't show up empty-handed. The text tells us that the Lord brings with him the rod and the staff. The rod and the staff. Those were the tools of the shepherd. They provide protection for the sheep in the shepherd's care. And if you study sheep, what you'll discover is that they, were, they are not capable of protecting themselves. They're one of only two animals that were created that don't have a defense mechanism, a dove and a sheep. They are totally dependent on the shepherd to protect them. Here's, here's what I like about the rod and the staff, though it's important that the shepherd have both the rod and the staff. Yes, yes, yes. See, the rod was a club-like stick uh, that the shepherd used to fight off predators mm -hmm. that tried to kill the sheep. The staff was useful for protecting the sheep from, uh, from the rod was uh, useful for protecting sheep from external mm -hmm. forces. Conversely, the staff was a long stick with a hook on it, with a curve at the end. You might have seen it in, in the movies from time to time. And the shepherd usually had to use the staff when the sheep tried to stray away from the fold or put itself in danger. The shepherd used the hook of the staff to pull the sheep back in line. In other words, the shepherd used the rod to protect the sheep from outside enemies but use the staff to protect the sheep from themselves. Yes, yes. And I'm so glad that God has the rod and the staff because sometimes I need protection from forces outside of me. And then there are other times when I need protection from myself. Sometimes my enemies are people and forces and situations from the outside trying to take me out. But other times, my biggest enemy is in a me. Y'all with me? Sometimes my biggest enemy is in a me. Uh, sometimes I need protection even from myself. Oh, I'm almost done. It's a matter of perseverance. It's a matter of perception. It's a matter of presence. 
it's a matter of protection. But finally, it's a matter of perspective. Yeah. Mm. Somebody say that, perspective. perspective. The text says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. At the end of the day, no matter what I face in the valley, even if it is the valley of the shadow of death, I can make it out because the Lord comforts me. Well, that's good news for somebody today. I, I know you miss and would continue to miss your husband, your father, your son, your friend. Uh, but uh, God can comfort you. I say God uh, can comfort you. I know Frank, Frankie, Free, Colonel Freeman touched your life. But I want to encourage you that notwithstanding this loss, God is able to comfort you. And believe me, no one can comfort like God can. Yeah. That's why the Bible says God is able to do exceeding, yeah. abundantly above all yeah. that we could ask him, <laughs> according to the power that worketh in us. What I, what I love about this meaning of the word translated comfort uh, is in, 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 in this text, uh, the word from the original Hebrew not only means to bring consolation, but it also means to change one's mind. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, that means God is able to touch us and comfort us in such a way that our minds are changed. In other words, it's a matter of perspective. No matter what we're going through, even if it is the valley of the shadow of death, God is able to change our minds and give us the right perspective such that we are no longer victims but victors. Yeah. We're no longer discouraged but encouraged. We're no longer chumps, but champs. No longer bitter, but better. It's a matter of perspective. That's why Isaiah 41 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will up the, uphold thee with my righteous right hand. That's why Psalm 138 says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, Thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies. Thy right hand shall save me. And when you realize that God is with you, and when you realize you can allow the rod and the staff to comfort you, you can say like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroy. It's a matter of perseverance, perception, presence, protection. But ultimately, you can make it through the valley if you have the right perspective. If you believe God's word that is true, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Of
at this time, our uniformed personnel, past and present, please stand. Our God, prepare. things. I want to, first of all, thank all of you on behalf of the family for coming out and participating in this home moment celebration. I want to thank Reverend Gray McKenzie for the powerful word that he shared with us. I want to thank also the BEP uh, police for their presentation. <coughs> At this time, we want, to, we want everybody to stand except for the family who will remain seated. We want to pray uh, in, in the service at this point. All right, let us uh, turn our hearts and minds to God. Dear God of eternity, life is so precious to each of us that all that is within us says no to death. We see death as the dark, mysterious enemy that destroys the good that you have created. Help us to see death as you see it. Not the end, but the beginning. Not a wall, but a doorway. Not a dark road, but a path that leads to eternal life, to eternal life and life. We will miss our beloved Frank, but we thank you, Lord, for the memory. May our minds and hearts be filled with wonderful recollections of the past. Help our sadness to wear a smile. Passing of time wipes the tears away. Time can be a great physician, healing the void that we now feel. Every life, every life is a gift from you, dear Father. Thank you for sharing this special man, this special person, this father, this son, this uncle, this brother in the ranks of the Howard University Fellowship, thank you for sharing his life with us. We will cherish the memory forever, forever and ever. God, may you watch over this family. May you keep them safe. Wrap them in your loving arms, Father. When they have problems, when they have trouble walking through the valley, we pray that you give them perspective. Let them see, Father, that you are there. Give them protection. Show them compassion. And I ask this of all of those that are in attendance today. Let this not be the last time you see the family. Let this not be the last time you speak to, to the family. They needed you now, but they'll need you even more yeah, yeah. as they go forward. Yeah. So I pray all those wonderful things that you said, that you will walk them out, live them out, and you will be there for the family in their time of need. We ask all these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and all those in present, all those at the sound of my voice, say amen, 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 amen. 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 amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, the services for Mr. Freeman are concluded here at the funeral home today. However, on behalf of Mrs. Freeman and her family, you are invited to his burial. He's going to be buried with military honors at Sheltonham, Maryland Veterans Cemetery, but it's going to be at a later date. We don't have that date yet, but it will be the week of the 24th. So you can always call the funeral home and we can give you the information. Thank you. Yes, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry, but on the back of your program, the family has invited you all to the repast. Please join them.